to turn to a discussion of what, how we approach a patient who has disease that has failed to respond um, adequately to the first TKI that they've received, um, or that they cannot tolerate, or they have into the patient has intolerance to the drug. Um, so the question kind of that we're, we're confronted with when we see a patient who is not obtaining optimal res response or has lost response or just really has significant toxicities but they can't be maintained on that drug um, is what is the next right therapy? And I think that it might be best um, for us to just go through and see what type of patient would be optimal for the various TKIs that we have at our disposal. So, you know, I'd, I'd ask you to start with desantinib. So you mean in the second line setting? In the second um, line setting. Yeah. So, so first of all, you know, um, because desatinib is structurally distinct from both imatinib and nilotinib, I think um, it's certainly a reasonable thing to think about in any patient that you start on one of those two drugs who, who has resistance um, uh, or certainly intolerance. Um, uh, but, but we're here talking about, about resistance. And um, what we discussed earlier is obviously critically important, you know, determining, trying to, sending a mutation test, trying to determine if there is going to be a mutation that's cross-resistant, such as the T315I mutation, that's cross-resistant to desatinib, in which case it would render it, you know, completely ineffective. But, you know, we have more long-term follow-up with desatinib in the second line than any other kinase inhibitor. Um, certainly, pleural effusion is, um, you know, the, 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 the most common bothersome toxicity with it, um, occurring in close to 30% to or so of patients, um, primarily grade two uh, events. Um, as we discussed earlier, there is a low incidence. Uh, after seven years of follow-up in that study, the incidence of pulmonary arterial hypertension was less than 1%, um, but it's there um, and it's potentially it's both serious and potentially irreversible, and it may be under-recognized because during the first few years of the trial, people didn't really, really think to, 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 to look for it. Um, but I'd say what's been encouraging, you know, is, you know, the, that's, that's mostly it in terms of, you know, to, uh, of uh, bothersome toxicities. In terms of serious and irreversible toxicities, I think, I think primarily we're talking about that very low incidence of pulmonary arterial hypertension. Um, so I think you know it, it's it, for many patients it's convenient because it's once a day with or without food, um, and as long as there isn't a, a mutation that that that, uh, that should be cross resistant. And again, these are available in the NCCN guidelines, but the the, the most common ones are at position F317 and, and at T315. Um, then I. Think I think it's. I think it's actually a very reasonable uh, agent. Um, the other thing that we learned from the seven-year follow-up, and this is important to realize, that these patients in the seven-year follow-up were much more heavily pretreated, and you know, even had been treated a third of them. So, so the median duration of disease for these patients was four years or greater than four years on that study uh, before they came on desatinib. And the majority, uh, and, and, and a third or more of those patients had been treated with 800 milligrams of imatinib. So they'd been you know, exposed to already high doses of imatinib. Um, I thought it was rather encouraging that um, with eight years of, follow with seven years of follow-up, um, 12, on, on, I'll say only, only 12% of people died due to disease progression. Um, so, I mean, I think that that argues that certainly in the second line setting, um, one should consider a second generation TKI, um, such as desatinib or nilotinib or bosutinib, um, uh, relative to going to allogeneic stem cell transplantation. Excellent. Is there can you describe the patient who would not be a candidate for desatinib? Do you think that someone who has had um, lung disease that it, that desatinib is absolutely contraindicated? Well, yeah, there are. So there are no absolute contraindications um, for um, desatinib. Um, but you know, certainly, if you have a, in my opinion, if you have a patient who has who has already has a baseline oxygen requirement, let's say, in which case what we would otherwise consider to be a relatively small pleural effusion 
may tip them over the, the, the edge to where they, they need to be hospitalized and maybe even intubated. You know, certainly I would, I would stay away uh, in such a patient. I'd probably stay away also in any patient who has a history of pulmonary arterial hypertension. Um, um, but uh, th th that would be, I'd say those would be the, the, the primary. Of course, you know, it's recommended to not co-administer desatinib with gastric acid suppression therapy. Um, having said that, um, in my clinical experience, I've administered 100 milligrams of desatinib to patients on, on GERD therapy, and we know many of them just are unwilling to give up those those antacid therapies, and I've you know I can't tell you that that the responses are as good in these patients as they would have been um, if they were not on those antacids. But I've certainly seen complete molecular responses uh, with 100 milligrams. Uh, so it, it's certainly not, that's certainly not a contraindication. It's just it, there's more concern of possible lack of efficacy. But I'm, I'm as we discussed earlier, I, I think lower since we think lower doses are effective. I think absorption is generally sufficient um, uh, in that setting. Great, and Dago's one of.